there's no likelihood that the NDP would ever, under any circumstance, be able to support Mr. Harper. His divisive politics, his backward economics that have left 400,000 manufacturing jobs disappear over the last few years. There are 300,000 more unemployed today than when his first recession struck. Canada is the only country in the world to have withdrawn from the Kyoto Protocol. I think that one of the biggest challenges that the future Prime Minister is going to have to face is dealing with the real issue of climate change. So the short answer to your question is, there isn't a snowball's chance in hell. Yes, the saber rattling continued today to discuss what all this could look like if the Conservatives only secure a minority mandate and face a pair of takedown artists. Let's bring in our midweek strategist, former Harper Cabinet Minister Monty Solberg is in Calgary. Sarah Bain is a real change red liberal with Hill and Knowlton, and she's here in the studio with NDP insider Shea Purdy of Suma. Welcome to you all. Thanks. Monty, let's assume uh, your idea of hell happens and uh, it's a conservative <laughs> minority. What do you think the aftermath looks like? Well, it's very hard to say, of course, but, uh, you know, I think there's lots of wiggle room, even in that sort of declaratory type statement that we just heard from Thomas Mulcair. Uh, it depends a lot on what uh, the opposition is asked to vote on when uh, when that point comes. You know, should the Conservatives be in power? Uh, they bring in a throne speech. It's larded up with things that are pretty appealing to the public. Uh, at that point, I think opposition parties really start to wonder if it's in their interest to vote against things that are very popular with the Canadian public. Yeah, I gotta wonder if like you had 100, you need 170 seats for a majority. What if they get around 160 to 165? Do you think the Liberals and NDP can form some sort of deal and actually work as a, a cohesive government, if you will, Sarah? Well, I'm, I won't fall into the trap of, of speaking to that, but um, <laughs> I, I, think, <laughs> I think that yesterday, mm -hmm. um, when Mr. Trudeau was asked first about it, well, we, I think we'll all look back on, on this election and, and see this, this, these two comments as defining moments in this election, um, because Mr. Trudeau made it quite clear yesterday um, that he would not, not for one day, support a government held by Mr. Harper, um, because we've had enough. Canadians have had enough, and Mr. Trudeau will not allow Mr. Mr. Harper uh, to run this government for yeah, one no day. Love with Tom Mulcair from Justin Trudeau either. Well, you're, we, <laughs> Which we, devil is he going to dance with? We participate in right? elections to win. So let's, let's wait until the oh, election well, is over. No, but right now, we participate in elections, and Canadians get that. We talk about coalition and cooperation, but Canadians talk about who are they going to vote for. And they're picking who they're voting for. Yeah, but, okay. Shay, I just think that people now feel there's a sense of comfort in voting for either party because mm -hmm. they know the two are going to get together and take down the guy that most people say they don't want. Yeah, you're quite right about that. And Sarah's correct that these are significant moments. I, I think Trudeau saying what he said yesterday is more significant than Tom's comments today. I don't think there was any doubt that Tom was going to say something like that. Whereas with Trudeau, there might have been a seed of doubt that he would continue to support the agenda of the Harper Conservatives, especially if he was in a situation where instead of supporting a, an NDP government, the first one ever, he had to support the Conservatives. Maybe there was some doubt that he, he might have chosen the Conservatives, but I, it's nice that he's put that to bed. And now we can talk a little bit more uh, in more, more, more real terms about what happen, happens after the election. Monty, do you think the, the, the Stephen Harper should be sounding the alarm a little more loudly now because both these parties have basically said, I mean, a majority looks unlikely for either of the two agents for change, and, and Stephen Harper wouldn't last, uh, it doesn't sound like he's going to last even a month if, if he doesn't get a majority. Shouldn't he be trying to rile up the base with talk about this? He doesn't seem to be doing that. Well, uh, there will be a time, I think, when you when you ask something of Canadians, and that's usually in the last 10 days of a, of a campaign where you you really help lay out some the scenario and ask people for their vote and uh, make the case you want to continue on for four more years. Uh, in the meantime, though, I think, you know, the parties are still really busy positioning themselves on the issues. And uh, those issues actually will probably matter uh, much more than, you know, what becomes sort of inside baseball, uh, the kind of inside baseball that maybe we're talking about now. I think people are way more interested in where parties stand on issues like the economy, uh, security, national defense, uh, those kinds of things. That's what people talk about uh, typically at the doors as opposed to the, you know, sort of the confusing world of uh, what happens uh, in a minority parliament situation after an election. Uh, oh, Monty, you know very well the ballot box question isn't those issues. It's Stephen Harper, stay or go. 
I mean, that's the ballot box what? question. So now we've got to deal with well, whether it's a minority coalition or majority Harper government. That's the only two choices. Yeah, well, I, I'm not sure that everyone does see it that way. I think a lot of people say we want competent leadership. Uh, and they they look at somebody who's inexperienced like Justin Trudeau or somebody with a pretty radical agenda like Thomas Mulcair. And they go, ah, I don't know. I, I'm not sure it's worth the risk. Radical. So He's closer it's to not you guys than Justin it, Trudeau. <laughs> <laughs> well, but it's <laughs> that that's true. They're running very much toward the middle. But uh, I think a lot of people won't be they won't be confused. The thing is, Don, and I think this is important, is that a lot of this is not that kind of bifurcated uh, scenario that you've just described. I think it's way more complicated for people because the world is uncertain. So even if people are a little bit tempted to kick the tires with Justin Trudeau or with Thomas Mulcair, uh, in normal times, they might they might actually do that. But right now, there's All so right. many things at play in the world that they're, they're not going to do that. Shay, is this a ballot box over the economy or a ballot box about Stephen Harper? Well, I, I think it's about Stephen Harper fundamentally, and you, you point quite rightly to the fact that that's what voters need to decide first. And the Conservatives haven't come out strongly against this because they're going to have a hard time scaring people against the uh, prospective coalition government. I think there's an appetite for that, especially because the desire for change is so high. Sarah? Again. Dawn. You're not going to take the fifth again, are you? <laughs> you we, we participate in elections to win. So right now, Mr. Trudeau is talking to Canadians about a new vision for Canada, a vision that doesn't have Mr. Harper as the prime minister. So when Canadians are going to the ballots, they're going to be asking themselves a choice of three, ah, but not a choice of your two leader plus today one plus opened one. the door to a vision of Trudeau Har Mulcair. That's what he opened the door to yesterday. Well, as a liberal, I'm voting for a liberal. Of I'm not you voting are. for a liberal plus one. If you vote for the NDP, it's a news bulletin here on the show. All right, I want to move <laughs> along because there's this story. I've got to just bring this up to me. We've got all these strange candidates uh, coming out. Uh, the latest um, is a conservative hopeful in uh, Winnipeg. He was on, caught on video uh, comparing abortion to 9-11 and the Holocaust. Uh, we have an uh, NDP -er in Hamilton. Now, this one's really uh, taking off on Twitter right now. She uh, made a posted a joke about Auschwitz and talked about phallic symbols uh, being seen on the, on the polls there. And when she was cornered for an explanation about this last night, she told the Hamilton Spectator, What's, I didn't know what Auschwitz was. Um, okay, moving on. And then there's this conservative in Toronto. And we'll bring in a video clip of Joe Daniels. He's an incumbent running for a re-election, and he had this to say about Muslims and the refugee exodus. Here's what he had to say. There's a different agenda going on in terms of whereas at the same time Saudi Arabia is putting up money for 200 mosques in Europe. So I think the agenda is to try and move as many Muslims into some of these European countries to change those countries in a major way. That's something I certainly don't want to see happening in Canada. All right, this is the last two days, guys. Two guys. We know there's been tons of other examples of candidates doing this. What, what's the limit? What do, what do we need to do to make sure we sort of take away the stupidity factor from candidates running for office, Shay? And I want you to address your candidate, by the way, in Hamilton. <laughs> Um, you know, she's uh, she Alex Johnstone. She should know what Auschwitz is, and she's a school trustee, by the way. Yeah, I had heard a little bit about it, this story, not the latest developments. I, it's interesting. I, I think the NDP has had a better time with candidates this election than either now. the Liberals or the Conservatives. I, there was only one candidate who had to unfortunately resign over some comments that just they didn't want to make a big story. Mm -hmm. The Conservatives have had a number of candidates go, and the Liberals as well. And, and I think it's a problem for the Conservatives of just not having people interested in running for them. They had 33 of their own incumbent MPs not run. I think that's the biggest problem for them. Monty, this is new, though. I don't recall this epidemic of candidates getting in trouble in 2011. What's going on? Well, I think part of the, part of the problem is people have uh, longer and longer history on social media. I mean, some of these examples aren't have nothing to do with social media. But in other cases, uh, you know, they have these long histories with social media. It sounds to me like uh, parties need to get together and uh, crowdsource uh, uh, their supporters to go and check out the history of some of the people that are, that are contemplating running because it's it really is uh, it's unbelievable the numbers of people that are getting in in trouble. But maybe it's also going to be a case, Don, where you know people start to get a pass if they said something in the distant past 
that really was, uh, you know, something that's not completely relevant anymore. They've got, there's a lot of years that have passed in between. Maybe that'll happen. Uh, but uh, parties are going to have to do a better job or they're going to get caught up by all these people who prowl Facebook and Twitter uh, to find out what people said years ago. Yeah. Sarah, you were shaking your head. I don't think so. I think that um, we need to be really careful. Each of us has to be incredibly careful um, as to what we say online. And uh, our online footprint, our social footprint, lasts forever. It is permanent. And I, I, I don't want to actually criticize or be angry at any of the, the war rooms because having been in, in two of them, it is there, there's an extremely stringent process to go through to become a candidate. Um, I think that certainly parties are going to have to get far better at it. But it's up to individuals. If you want to run for office, you need to know what you've said in the past. You need to be accountable for what you've said in the past. I think in some cases, you know, individuals explain and justify and uh, apologize. But at some point, candidates have to be accountable for what they've done in the past. And they have to be honest when they're going through the green light process so that we can avoid this in the future. But I got to I got to come back to this Auschwitz thing. I'm sorry, Shay. I know you didn't know about it until just when you walked in the studio. But maybe shouldn't there be a minimum level of knowledge, maybe a history test for some of these candidates? <laughs> Perhaps. Don, I think maybe there's a little bit more to learn about this now. If this is just a chatter on Twitter, I'm not going to take no, anything No, no, no. It's written on the paper and she's quoted in it. Yeah, well, I think there's still a little bit to learn about it. If, if that's indeed the case, it's unfortunate and she'll certainly know what it is in the future. Would that embarrass you if she stands by her ha ignorance on this Having been one? there myself, yes. Monty, you got to have a thought on this Auschwitz controversy. What do you think? Well, I mean, I think it's unbelievable that a candidate uh, would stand for public office and has uh, not even that kind of an understanding of one of the most important events in world history. Uh, and uh, it does really re sort of call, I think it's, it's a clarion call for everyone to raise standards when it comes to recruiting uh, candidates. Uh, you know, this, this next Maybe time... Maybe they shouldn't I, pee in a I coffee mean, mug either, though, Monty. Well, of course. I mean, that's uh, I'm not throwing stones. In this. <laughs> that's right. You should not do that when you're, especially when you're on camera, Don. Uh, so, no, clearly, clearly, everyone has to pick up their game a little bit, and uh, you know, yeah. forewarned is forearmed. Next time around, we could be into a campaign within, you know, a year or 18 months after the uh, next uh, after October 19th. And everyone will have to be going at it hard again to make sure that everybody's squeaky clean this time. All right. Thank you all. We'll talk to you next week.